Professor Hawking, uh, Ambassador Phillips, uh, colleagues, friends, and, uh, and guests, uh, I'd like uh, to begin by extending a very warm welcome to our guest uh, of honor, Professor Hawking. Uh, Tel Aviv University feels privileged and delighted to host you here uh, tonight. Uh, physics uh, has been very important at Tel Aviv University from uh, its uh, early days. And there is a strong emphasis on physics and, and science in a, in a comprehensive uh, university and to host a scientist of your caliber is, is a great uh, privilege for us. Uh, I also would like to add that we unfortunately know uh, all too much about uh, ALS at Tel Aviv University, uh, both as a subject for uh, scientific investigation and uh, hopeful, uh, hopefully finding uh, some remedy for this orphan disease, uh, but uh, also uh, uh, we are familiar with, uh, with several heroic uh, ALS stories on this campus and uh, in this country, and uh, we have we've made the research on ALS uh, a research uh, priority uh, uh, for Tel Aviv University. And finally, we are an educational uh, institution. We try to instill in our students and in uh, the Israeli public uh, a sense of respect for uh, what the human spirit can achieve, and, and you are a, an icon and a model for uh, all of us, which reinforces uh, our sense of privilege in hosting you tonight. Uh, very briefly, uh, I'd like to, uh, <coughs> to put some flesh on, uh, on what Professor Oz uh, referred to earlier as the lean years of uh, the Israeli Academy uh, in the early years of this, uh, this decade. Uh, in some respects, what I will say will uh, sound familiar to you. Um, Britain has been the model for building uh, the higher education and scientific research system in this, uh, in this country. And uh, some of what has afflicted uh, higher education and scientific research in, in England um, has arrived in Israel a few years uh, later. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, the question of uh, funding uh, higher education, quality higher education and scientific uh, research, the need um, to balance between allocating the necessary funds in the state budget uh, and uh, the need to finance at least part of the expenditure through tuition the political dimension of the issue of uh, tuition, the issue of uh, offering uh, access to higher education 
to less privileged uh, segments of uh, society and again the need to balance uh, greater access uh, with uh, quality control and the preservation of what almost by definition are uh, elitist institution uh, in the middle of, uh, uh, of a system that seeks uh, equality and, uh, and greater access issues of uh, universities vis-a-vis -vis versus uh, colleges and the arrival in this country of what uh, is known as foreign extensions of uh, foreign university uh, without getting into names I can tell you that I met the uh, uh, Chancellor of uh, Second Echelon British University who told me uh, with a smile that uh, their university had his university had more students in Israel than in Britain um, and uh, of course there is a universal hunger for higher education uh, but quality control uh, becomes even more uh, more of an issue and so in the uh, in the last few years uh, we in Tel Aviv University and our colleagues in the other research universities in Israel uh, had to invest a huge effort uh, not only in, in balancing the, the books, but in uh, keeping uh, uh, quality, in assuring uh, the future of science, uh, in making sure that there is no brain drain in this country, that a young uh, uh, scientists and uh, uh, graduate and postgraduate students uh, both have a future and see a future in science uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this country and sometimes having to do that against uh, populist trends in politics and populist trends uh, in, uh, in government, uh, government circles. Uh, our sense is that uh, we have turned a corner. Uh, to some extent, uh, it, it was the achievement or the, it, was, it was the achievements of Israeli scientists, the fact that uh, two Nobel Prizes uh, in the sciences were given in this uh, uh, in this country resonated in this country and the scientists have done remarkably well in taking advantage of the podium they were given by saying very eloquently that uh, it was wonderful to be the first recipient uh, of a Nobel Prize in Science in Israel hopefully they won't be the last ones uh, so in a symbolic way this, this resonated and I think played a very important role in changing the tide uh, among decision makers and in, uh, in the public in, in general. Uh, the present government is much, uh, much more attuned uh, to higher education and uh, this, this year is going, to first, uh, is going to be the first year in several in which there actually is not going to be a cut in the allocation uh, to higher education by the, uh, by the government. Furthermore, the government responded uh, to pressure and uh, uh, <coughs> suggestions mostly from the academy and put together a blue ribbon committee uh, headed by a former minister of uh, finance uh, a man who is open to the issues of uh, higher education takes a, an enlightened view of these issues and uh, this, uh, this commission is going to, to look not just in the issue of budgeting higher education but uh, uh, hopefully we'll uh, uh, propose a whole series of measures meant to uh, uh, <coughs> update uh, or bring the uh, system uh, that had been under assault in the last few years into full gear uh, with the realities of, uh, of this, dec this decade and this century. And so uh, we are still uh, somewhat anxious about the future, but much more optimistic than we were let's say a year ago and we can welcome you in this university uh, with a much more secure sense of uh, self-confidence and an optimistic view for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Hawkin, Professor Rabinovich, 
assembled professors, because I know there are a lot of you uh, out there, ladies and gentlemen, and mere mortals uh, like myself. Uh, it's very nice to be here this evening back uh, at the university. And I thought I just wanted to give a few really personal impressions about what the visit has meant to me and I think to all my staff uh, over the last few days. And they've been a pretty astonishing few days, um, meeting Professor Hawkins, listening to his lecture, seeing him meet people, but above all, seeing the response to him uh, from the people of Israel and indeed the Palestinians. And it struck me that the visits actually got meaning on several levels. The first level, it's obviously about UK scientific and academic excellence and that tradition of free inquiry and radical imagination which has characterized Professor Hawkins' work and without which the scientific spirit would be a very dull and unambitious thing. At a second level, the visit's been about UK-Israel scientific cooperation and the shared value we put on objective, disinterested research and indeed that wonderful human quality curiosity and the curiosity that I saw on the faces of the students at the Bloomfield Museum on Sunday. The tradition of bilateral cooperation may, I suppose, be reckoned to start with Heim Weizmann uh, and his valuable role in the First World War in enabling us to manufacture liquid acetone, liquid acetone. Uh, but it's now grown, in, fortunately, up into more peaceful purposes to encompass research, information sharing, and technological transfer, as well as science education, both between academics and between British and Israeli companies. I'd like to highlight the Science Networking Development Scheme, which is jointly funded by the UK Science Office of Science and Technology in the Department of Trade and Industry, and the Israeli Ministry of Science, Culture and Sport. This scheme promotes collaboration between British and Israeli researchers in areas ranging from the natural to exact sciences. A further example, and one from among many possible ones, would be the Computer Mind Alertness Program developed by the Israeli company Cognifit for the British School of Motoring, a program which won the prestigious Prince Michael's Road Safety Award. I welcome and endorse, too, the British Council's new program in Israel, Beautiful Science, which links science, education, and the arts to inspire young people to consider a career in science and encourage young scientists to communicate with the wider public in an open, comprehensive, and interactive way. At a third level, I think Professor Hawkins' visit has been about how science can transcend regional borders, in this case, the ones between Israel and the Palestinian territories, how human beings of all races and backgrounds share the hunger for knowledge. At the fourth and even deeper level, the visit has starkly illustrated how the big questions which Professor Hawking has made it his lifetime task to ask and try to answer transcend all national and political barriers. I was struck by some words of his which reflect a yearning which I think all human beings share, even if none of us is quite as well equipped as he is to try and answer them. And I quote, My goal is simple. It is complete understanding of the universe, what it is, and how it exists at all. At the fifth level, and perhaps the strongest image for us all, there is the individual human story of a man who has refused to be beaten by the enforced limitations of his body and whose mind has reached to the frontiers of the universe and of knowledge. I think that many of us thought that it was us, not him, who were actually the disabled ones, lacking his intellectual skills and his courage and determination. So I'd like to thank the university for hosting this evening. Can you hear me, Linda, here? Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. I'd like to thank the university for hosting us this, this evening, but above all, I'd like to thank Professor Hawkin for accepting the invitation to visit us in this country and for reminding us that we should be prepared to challenge our own limitations and to receive safe wisdoms which we have come to take for granted. To be curious, to break boundaries in the cause of knowledge and of freedom, and to think it new whether the issue be information retrieval from a black hole or how to resolve long-standing conflicts which we have allowed to define and limit those engaged directly in them as well as those looking in from the outside. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, as I said, uh, Professor Stephen Hawking needs no introduction. He is well known for his scientific uh, contribution on singularities in uh, gravitational theories, on quantum black holes. And uh, the title of his uh, brief talk today will be The State of uh, Cosmology. Can you hear me?
we have made tremendous progress in cosmology in the last hundred years. The general theory of relativity and the discovery of the expansion of the universe shattered the old picture of an ever-existing, an everlasting universe. Instead, general relativity predicted that the universe, and time itself, would begin in the Big Bang. It also predicted that time would come to an end in black holes. The discovery of the cosmic microwave background, and observations of black holes, support these conclusions. This is a profound change in our picture of the universe and of reality itself. Although the general theory of relativity predicted that the universe must have come from a period of high curvature in the past, it could not predict how the universe would emerge from the Big Bang. Thus general relativity on its own cannot answer the central question in cosmology, why is the universe the way it is? However, if general relativity is combined with quantum theory, it may be possible to predict how the universe would start. It would initially expand at an ever-increasing rate. During this so-called inflationary period, the marriage of the two theories predicted that small fluctuations would develop and lead to the formation of galaxies, stars, and all the other structure in the universe. This is confirmed by observations of small non-uniformities in the cosmic microwave background with exactly the predicted properties. So it seems we are on our way to understanding the origin of the universe, though much more work will be needed. A new window on the very early universe will be opened when we can detect gravitational waves by accurately measuring the distances between spacecraft. Gravitational waves propagate freely to us from earliest times, unimpeded by any intervening material. By contrast, light is scattered many times by free electrons. The scattering goes on until the electrons freeze out, when the universe is 300,000 years old. Despite having had some great successes, not everything is solved. We do not yet have a good theoretical understanding of the observations that the expansion of the universe is accelerating again after a long period of slowing down. Without such an understanding, we cannot be sure of the future of the universe. Will it continue to expand forever? Is inflation a law of nature? Or will the universe eventually collapse again? New observational results and theoretical advances are coming in rapidly. Cosmology is a very exciting and active subject. We are getting close to answering the age-old questions. Why are we here? Where did we come from? Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. So before uh, we start dinner, it will be my task to uh, discuss challenges in physics.
and the new horizons will be uh, after the uh, first course. I will do that in the context of uh, the School of Physics and Astronomy. And uh, what I'm going to cover are, uh, first of all, in physics, uh, theoretical and experimental issues. And uh, as theoretical, I uh, use the, the picture for black holes, evaporating black holes. And uh, as experimental, I uh, took the picture of the Large Hadron, Hadron Collider in CERN uh, being uh, built uh, currently. The other uh, thing will be uh, applied physics, and here I uh, took the picture of optical fibers as a representative. And then there is the interdisciplinary physics, biophysics, which will be discussed uh, uh, later again. Now, the School of Physics and Astronomy in Tel Aviv University has uh, three departments. One of them is astronomy and astrophysics. The second is condensed uh, matter physics. And this one includes applied physics and medical physics. Pretty much it includes everything that is not particle physics or astrophysics. The last one is particle physics, including nuclear physics. And I'm going to arrange the problems according to uh, uh, this. Uh, physics research is uh, sometimes uh, working uh, theory before, like in this example, and, uh, or sometimes experiment uh, before, and in fact, I will start with the, the most important experiment of all. There is uh, one such experiment that we know of, which is the creation of the universe, uh, on which uh, Professor Hawking uh, talked about. And in fact, it has not been explained yet. And uh, what I mean by this is that we lack both the theory and experimental data. Theory, because all our equations, as far as we know them, break down. And experimental data, because if we uh, look at the cosmic microwave background, we can push it about 100,000 years or so uh, after the Big Bang, but not uh, before that. This also uh, raises the question that Professor Hawking raised as well, the fate of the universe, because uh, if you look at the picture where the universe started from a singularity, you can just run the time backwards, and then it looks as if it's going to collapse. And there is the question, what is the fate of the universe? And that depends on uh, the following question. Uh, it turns out that most of the matter in the universe is not what we are made of. It's not made of electrons or protons. These are about 3 or 4 percent. In fact, 25 percent is dark matter, but we don't know what is dark matter. Uh, we call it dark matter because it doesn't radiate. Uh, it is probably weakly interacting, but we do not know what it, what it is made of. We cannot directly detect it, and we do not know whether we can produce it in the lab. And 70% of uh, uh, the content is dark energy, which is even more uh, bizarre, because we can detect it so far only through the expansion of the universe, the acceleration of the universe. And the fate of the universe depends pretty much on this data, in particular whether it changes in time. Another aspect uh, of, uh, of interest in this, uh, in this department is the issue of uh, formations of stars and planets, where we distinguish stars from planets pretty much by whether they are burning hydrogen or not. And the search and study of planets, in particular planets that can allow life, habitable planets, is a very important uh, research uh, topic. Moving to particle physics, particle physics has a very nice picture of the family of elementary particles arranged in three families. And uh, the three families uh, are families of leptons and quarks, and they are also the, the mediators of, uh, of forces. And there is the, f the question why this structure, which we have not been able to explain uh, so far. The origin of particle masses is also a very important question. We do not know yet what is the mechanism, and this is the Atlas detector. This is the picture of the Atlas detector, which is currently being completed in CERN. And this is pretty much an old picture. By now, it is, it is, uh, it is much more constructed. And in Israel, there are three teams that are, doing, uh, that are joining in this work, one in Tel Aviv, one in the Technion, and one in Weizmann Institute. And they will participate also in the data analysis. And one of the main goals of this is to look for the so-called Higgs particle which might be the clue to uh, the origin of the particle masses. 
There are four known forces of nature, maybe more, but we know four. Electromagnetism and gravity are the well-known ones. Then there are the weak and the strong, which are short distance forces uh, responsible for radioactive decays and some uh, nuclear interactions. And one particular force is interesting. This is the gravitational force. And the gravitational force has the property uh, that it, it bends and curves space-time. And here the question is to test it at short distances. And short distances would mean uh, even uh, less than a 0 0.1 of a millimeter, and also when it is strong. Because general relativity, the theory of gravity, which is supposed to be uh, the correct one so far, has not been really tested in these uh, regimes. The physicists also think that all these forces are actually manifestations of uh, one force, and this is called grand unification. And here there is this building where part of the building is completed. This is the unification of the weak force and the electromagnetic force. But all the rest is still an open uh, question, and physicists are looking for this grand unified series. Uh, and the candidate, the leading candidate, is the so-called superstring theory, where there is a fundamental difference compared to other theories in which the, the particles are actually excitations of a string, a one-dimensional object. And, uh, 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 and th this theory has uh, very interesting predictions, but uh, what is unique about it is that if, e even the mathematics of this theory is not yet known. And so this raises the question about experimental signatures of, of this theory. And it has many. One interesting is that it uh, tells you that you should, you should see extra dimensions, more than the dimensions that we see. And here, actually, I uh, uh, brought a cartoon why we see that there are extra dimensions. So in this cartoon, uh, it is said that at this point we notice that this equation is beautifully, beautifully simplified if we assume that space-time has 92 dimensions. But this is not actually the way we see it. It actually has a consistency condition, but pretty much is a theoretical prediction. Next topic, which is, uh, we got accustomed to, is the quantum uh, world, the statistical nature of the quantum world where we cannot at the same time uh, com uh, measure uh, certain variables, physical variables, as accurately as we wish, which leads to this question, does God play dice? And here as an answer, I uh, picked up a quote from our guest, uh, Professor Stephen Hawking. This is from one of his uh, public lectures. And this is in the context of the physics of black holes. And he says that not only does God definitely play dice, but he sometimes confuses us by throwing them where they can't be seen. And here is the picture that I also downloaded from your lecture, where God throws a, a dice into the black hole and one out. The quantum, the, quantum uh, the quantum physics does work in daily life. That we know very well with all these pictures that I uh, just have here, the CD, the transistors, etc. But if I have to choose one unique, bizarre uh, property of the quantum world, this is this. So our British guests will definitely recognize that I just picked here the a map of the underground in London, the tube. And uh, the thing that you see here is, uh, is a tourist who wishes to visit uh, the guards of the Queen. And normally what the tourist would do is pick up the shortest path in the tube and go there. But this is actually not what is happening in the quantum world. What is happening in the quantum world is that this creature will go at all paths at the same time with a certain, with a certain uh, probability to each of them. And uh, can we use this bizarre property? And uh, that is the issue of quantum computations. So normally, the way we build computers, they are based on bits, which can take uh, values 0 or 1. But uh, if, you, if you draw conclusions from the previous picture, actually, we can ask a question whether we can build a, a so-called qubit, which will be at the same time at 0 and 1. And in fact, it has been done. But these are very, very simple computers. Big computers with, let's say, 10,000 qubits has not been, uh, uh, has not been uh, built yet. And there is there a question of a noise, but this is definitely one of the important questions. Moving now to the condensed matter department. Uh, here I chose uh, the discussion uh, of strongly interacting systems and whether they are new states of matter. And uh, as an example of a new state of matter that doesn't satisfy the normal standards uh, uh, 
theory, the normal standard theory, I chose the fractional quantum hole system where the behavior of resistance is not the usual one. And in fact, while high energy physicists go high in dimensions, the, low, the condensed matter physicists actually go low in dimensions and they look at one dimensional systems and two dimensional systems, which will bring us to the field of uh, nanophysics. Uh, I will describe it in a second. And uh, I presented here another uh, problem, another formidable problem, which is uh, high TC superconductivity. In fact, we lack theory and experiment. We do not know whether we can make a superconductor at room temperature and use it. In applied physics, I chose uh, the nanoscale physics, physics at nanometers, uh, where uh, the important thing that happens is that you need both electronics, optics, and DNA to technology to meet uh, and work at the same time. Here I looked at pictures of nanotubes and DNA transistors, and here I should point out that in Tel Aviv University, we do have an institute uh, for nanophysics where people, for, for scientists from different disciplines are uh, participating. Moving to biophysics or to the interdisciplinary, here I, uh, I should refer also to the lecture later, uh, but in fact biology works very differently than ordinary mathematics or physics that we know in the sense that we do not have very simple few basic rules from which we deduce everything. And therefore, it is still not clear whether uh, biology is an exact science or not, or can we make it an exact science? And in particular, can we use it to explain life and evolution? Lastly, I chose the human genome. So it's by now six years that we know the data, but we do not know how to use it and how to compare the data. Uh, can we track the evolution using this data in the past? Can we also predict the future? And finally, I should uh, put here a disclaimer because uh, probably what we currently consider as important questions may turn out to be not even the right questions to ask. Thank you. Maybe we should... Uh... Okay, I uh, suggest we continue with uh, our program. And uh, we asked Professor Hagai Netzer, uh, who participated in uh, uh, the establishment of a New Horizons program in astronomy, uh, to discuss that. Uh, the next speaker after him will be Professor Mikhail Kozlov about biophysics. I spent uh, last year on sabbatical and three months of the sabbatical at uh, Stanford University. Oh, Um, so, so I spent three months in California, mostly Palo Alto, and I want to tell you about one night that I went to one of the new uh, bookstores, or renewed bookstores uh, by the name of Kepler, by the way, and I was watching magazines, and I want to tell you what I saw in these magazines. On the cover of one there was President Bush, and next to him a beardy guy from Iran, I read, waving his hand and saying something about nuclear bomb. And next to it was the famous model, I think, from Brazil. And the one next to it was a very new, fast racing car. And the one just next to it, a magazine with a galaxy on the cover. And I was not surprised, and I don't think anybody else who was not an astronomer was surprised to see that, because I think galaxies and planets and black holes became part of everyday life. And perhaps this is the science where most of it is done. So what I'm going to, to tell you tonight in very, very few minutes is about New Horizons in Tel Aviv University and astronomy at uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, we have 11 uh, faculty, tenured faculty, about 2,000 uh, students, and we are dealing with many important 
issue or topics of modern astronomy, uh, let me show you some of them. We are dealing with galaxies of different type called uh, starburst galaxies. We are looking very carefully at supernovae. I'll give you the title for each one of them. We are looking at black holes and related issue, things that happen in centers of galaxies, giant black holes, and we are looking at the universe in general, at cosmology. And I want to tell you that each one of them can be the front page cover of a magazine next month or next year, because new photon in astronomy, which means studying these uh, topics and related topics, can also be in the public eye very, very quickly. So the main thing to remember, I guess, is that in order to do a good, important frontline astronomy nowadays, you need the right equipment. You need big telescopes on the ground and in space to do that. And our new horizons in astronomy is in fact an attempt to get Israel a chance to buy into a large telescope facility outside of Israel. I'm going to, to uh, show you briefly a few things that we are considering, but the main point is that we think that without being part of such a big consortium, of such a big project, we will not have the tool to continue and contribute in these and other areas of astronomy, but right now we think uh, most of the important science, or at least the very interesting and frontier science, is done. This project has a history of about five years. I'm not going to bore you with the details. We started in 2001 and then had a committee who came to visit, international committee, who came in 2002. And other things happened in 2002 and in 2006. In fact, just a few months ago, Tel Aviv University announced that they are going to find the funds to let us join such a collaboration. And these collaborations are various, and I'm going to show you three, but the common thing about them is that some of them are very, very expensive, and some others are terribly expensive. And it's very expensive to do modern type astronomy, but if you want to be there, you have to be part of this. And of course, Tel Aviv University came out, came out with a very nice sum of money that could be the seed to start such a collaboration. So here are three examples of the thing that we are going to try and do and going to try and join. Option one, I called it, is a big telescope which is being built uh, on La Palma in the Canary Islands. It's a Spanish telescope with international uh, collaboration on it. Let me show you the telescope which is being, uh, in fact, finished to be built and is going to start operation very, very soon, in a few months. Here is another option, something that we are considering in, in South Africa, a very new technology telescope, also extremely large. When I say large, I mean a mirror of 10 meters from one side to the other. And a third possibility, a third possibility, which may be the best, but in fact the most expensive and most difficult to join, is to join the European, 12 European nations, and very soon many more than 12, that have a very large, a very advanced, perhaps the most advanced observatory right now in Chile. And this is a picture of four big telescopes uh, on a mountain in, in the north part of Chile. So I want to take you back to, to finish to few areas of astronomy where one can contribute a lot. And in order to do that, I want to show you my stamp collection. I'm collecting stamps. And my stamp collection includes many stamps, all of them in astronomy. Uh, it's probably not too easy to see all the details, but each one of them represents a real object and was issued in a different country. And very important, perhaps the most important things in astronomy are, are shown on these stamps. Here are some more. The astronomers here will probably recognize the pet object. And just to complete the collection, I want to show you that some famous astronomers are also on these stamps. And I'm sure that our guests from the United Kingdom will recognize some of the astronomers because they are mostly British in this particular one. So there are hundreds of stamps in this. And I want to suggest that in a few years when we join such an observatory, I want to issue a new horizon stamp. And on this stamp, I'm going to put my favorite object in the universe, a black hole. This one exists already, so I'm not too original, but perhaps what we can do and will do in time, if the university will find the time, will find the money, and if they agree to issue the stamp, is to put on this stamp the title Tel Aviv University. Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you very much. Oops. I would like to ask uh, Professor Mikhail Kozlov to speak about biophysics. So I am happy to present uh, the biophysics program we applied for about a year ago and fortunately got approved by the Tel Aviv University. But before I go into details, some details, because my time is very limited, of the program, can you hear me? I, 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 have, to, I, sh I have to say a few words about biophysics in general. Biophysics is not, is not a well-defined discipline. Biophysics is something generally interdisciplinary. That's why biophysics includes physics and biology, actually, physical chemistry, and so on. And definition of biophysics research strongly depends on the team doing this research. In the case of our program, the major, uh, major, group, of, uh, uh, major group of people who applied, uh, who wrote down the program are physicists. Although we are dispersed between different schools and faculties of this university, beginning from exact sciences through biology uh, up to medicine, actually. I am from the medicine. We, uh, most of us have uh, background in theoretical physics or in physics, and that's why the program we are thinking of is uh, tending towards physics uh, of biological systems. More exactly, we are thinking about and are working on physics of biological molecules, uh, such, such as proteins and uh, nucleic acids and lipids. All these molecules are lying in the background of cell functioning and of cell structures, and we are trying to ask qu physical questions and to uh, treat uh, uh, the processes these molecules are involved in, in terms of uh, fundamental physical interactions. Uh, uh, but what is, what is uh, common for all these systems is that all these molecules, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids are a part of a living cell, and all of them, the functioning of a living cell, all processes within a living cell are based on uh, physical properties, we hope, on physical properties of, of these kinds of molecules. Now, I am going to present you just four specific projects involved in the program. The program is, is broader than that, but I don't have time, and these four projects cover the major part of the program of Horizons in Biophysics. The first uh, system is uh, the biological membrane. Biological membranes form all boundaries within the cell and their major boundary around the cell. Uh, oops. No, this is... This, this should be later. So where is this? Uh, and the, the major boundary around the cell. This is uh, called the plasma membrane and the boundaries of all intracellular organelles such as nucleus and, and the plasma reticulum and so on, they are all formed by biological membranes. Now, what is the biological membrane? The biological membrane is formed by lipid molecules. The lipid molecules are so-called, th th these are molecules of fat actually, but they have, they have some hydro, so-called hydrophilic group, meaning that the lipid molecules uh, uh, exhibit the, the property of self-assembly in aqueous solutions and, uh, due to the hydrophobic effect. And this self-assembly and the hydrophobic effect are underlying the self-assembly of membranes, uh, building up, up of the membranes and the stability of the membranes. The kind of questions we are asking in this context are the, the, the process of self-assembly itself and the properties of the membranes after it is formed. The membrane is a flexible uh, 
uh, is a flexible surface. That's why the, the membranes undergo fluctuations easily, shape changes and ch uh, changes in topology during membrane fusion and fission. Uh, so statistical physics and so-called soft metaphysics of membranes is one of our topics. In addition, we address uh, the properties of the proteins which are in, uh, in embedded into the membrane and which actually mediate uh, the main uh, biological uh, properties of the membrane. This, uh, the proteins uh, uh, enable cross-talk between the cell interior and the exterior uh, uh, medium. So we are addressing also the structural properties and the changes of structures of, this, of membrane proteins. The second uh, the second project I would like to mention is uh, related to uh, the famous DNA molecules, the uh, genetic, uh, genetic mol uh, the, the molecules uh, carrying the genetic information of the cell, as you know. But we are, again, we are addressing also in this case the physical properties of DNA. The DNA can be seen as a so-called polyelectrolyte, meaning it's, it, it can be seen one DNA molecule can be seen as a as a flexible, uh, uh, as a fle long flexible uh, thread-like molecule with uh, with uh, electrical charge, uh, 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 electrical charge, uh, charge uh, dispersed along the whole length of the molecule. And these polyelectrolytes are rather complicated, but the polyelectrolyte properties of DNA um, uh, determine uh, the. Uh, interaction between DNA and DNA, interaction between DNA and proteins, and interactions between DNA and lipid membranes, all these interactions and formation of complexes between DNA and other biological molecules are of primary importance for, for biology, for the cell function, and we hope we will understand physics of, of these biologically uh, important processes. The next, next system, I am very limited in time, the next system we are we address is so-called membrane, uh, so-called cell skeleton or cytoskeleton. A cell is a, a kind of a, of a uh, live body. A cell can move it can and can change its shapes. Its shape. That's why the cell needs some system, internal system, which uh, reminds bones and muscles. And the system really exists. Uh, the system is called cy uh, cy uh, uh, cytoskeleton. It consists of polymeric-like assemblies of proteins. And this, uh, this, uh, what, is uh, uh, what is amazing uh, from the point of view of physics about cytoskeleton, about these polymers, is that they are not in equilibrium. They are in, in the state of a constant self-assembly and disassembly. In, in, in best case, they are in the steady state. On one hand, on the other hand, they are rather rigid, so uh, that the persistence length of these proteins is of the same order of, of, of in, in, in the order of tens of microns, meaning it is the same order of magnitude as the cell itself. Meaning that this, these bonds are rigid on one hand, on the other hand, they are dynamic and they generate forces. They, gener they generate forces which move the cell which uh, enable the cell to move along the substrates and during the tissue formation and so, uh, and so on. So this process is uh, uh, related to the cytoskeleton. We, uh, this is one, uh, the, third, uh, the third topic of our uh, project. And the fourth, the last I would like to mention is uh, the so-called molecular motors. Molecular motors are uh, small engines consisting, every engine, every motor consists of one protein molecule, meaning that it, it has a dimension of uh, between nanometer and, and 10 nanometers. And these molecules know how to uh, transform the chemical energy into the mechanical energy. And these small motors, small engines, uh, run along, uh, along intercellular railways run, running uh, constantly along the uh, filaments of cytoskeleton and carry loads. They carry other substances, they can carry so-called vesicles. Physics of this process, physics of uh, conversion of the chemical energy in the, into the mechanical energy, and physics of the very motion of these proteins along the railways is amazing, is complicated, and this is what we want to, to understand. So I think that my time is roughly over. 
But what I would like to mention is the following, that at this stage, the major uh, team of involved in this biophysics uh, uh, project from the physics uh, side consists of theoretical physicists, of theoreticians. And our dream is to develop our community, biophysics community, community towards the experiments. So we want to, uh, uh, if we, uh, we will have funds to open uh, uh, experimental labs where experimental physicists will work on, on biological problems and more, more specifically we want to open one laboratory on so-called so single molecule biophysics and um, one laboratory on the structural bi biophysics of membrane proteins which involves crystallization of these proteins and, uh, and uh, investigations of the structural changes of these proteins. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I should stress this. Uh, we picked only two uh, subjects in uh, this uh, program of New Horizons. Actually, the university has more uh, disciplines and uh, topics. Uh, this uh, concludes uh, the official or the formal part of uh, the talks. And uh, as you may have noticed, everything was broadcasted live on the internet because there was a huge request. However, it, the broadcasting will stop while dining. And uh, if anyone wishes afterwards or during to talk about something, he's mostly welcomed. Otherwise, uh, enjoy your dinner. <laughs>